please get away as fast as you can. Don't walk, run before you're caught in the trap. Tonight on 2020, Sleeping with the Enemy. A bombshell decision in court this week. Just wanted to be done with this. Raven Abaroa, his first wife, murdered. Oh, his second wife growing scared and playing detective on the internet. And I thought, you know, there's no way, there's no way. The bottom line is that I wasn't involved with the death of my wife. Tonight, we take you back to the crime scene. A stranger's fingerprint, bloody shoe print, and stray DNA. Was there an intruder in the house? Or was the killer closer to home? A lot closer. The cold case squad never forgets about Raven. A cold case of murder that 2020 helped put back on the radar. The suspicions about Raven, bizarrely videotaping himself, his obsession with knives. That's my new knife, got for Christmas. And a detective's hunch that to solve the crime, you have to look in the victim's eyes, literally. The Pennsylvania judge has ordered authorities to exhume the body of Janet Abaroa. What secrets will the grave give up about a marriage gone south? What happened to divorce? Why not just get a divorce? Sleeping with the enemy. Here now, Elizabeth Vargas and David Muir. Tonight, the stunning case thrust back into the national spotlight. Two wives, one dead, one alive, and a murder investigation that had reached a dead end until 2020 got on the case. This evening, the legal bombshell just this week at a stunning turnaround. So tonight we take you from the courtroom to the crime scene, to the bedroom, and to something sitting on the bedside table, and a clue buried with the wife until now. And you'll see the video recorded by the murder suspect himself. Would his own words haunt him? John Quinones back on the case he broke wide open. <laughs> In the heart of Utah Salt Lake Valley, single mom Vanessa Pond raises her 11-year-old daughter. The only man she can depend on is her father, and he says she's fine with that. I used to jokingly refer to her as the president of the man-haters club. That is, until this man, Raven Abaroa, a good-looking 28-year-old widower, chats her up at their children's school. She agrees to have lunch. What was it about him that you liked? He seemed very upfront, very honest and genuine. I found out that, you know, he was a single father and I really, really admired that. <laughs> I've been a single mom for five years. I know what it takes to raise a child. I thought, you know, maybe I'll give him a chance. Vanessa and Raven were both raised Mormon and she felt she could take Raven and his son, Caden, under her wing. Did he mention his ex-wife or what happened to her? Yes. As we were just starting to date, you know, he just mentioned that my wife actually died. I immediately felt so sorry for him. He said that there was an intruder and that she was killed and that he'd found her. And he'd left it at that. But Vanessa can't put her curiosity aside about Raven's first wife. She goes online to find out more. The breaking story right now. 25-year-old Janet Abaroa murdered. She was stabbed to death. Stabbed three times. Stab wound in her chest. No one has been ruled out as a suspect. That night I stayed up until about 4 o'clock in the morning, reading blogs, watching his interviews. You know, this isn't happening to me. Uh, reading all the news stories about it and going out of my mind. Thinking what? I wasn't convinced that he was innocent. And watching a local TV interview taped after his wife's death doesn't help. Janet died that night. I remember watching the interview and I wasn't convinced. In the interview, they asked him, you know, what he saw, what he came home to. I don't like talking about what happened to her. And it's not because I don't love her. And it's not because I don't want to find out who did it, but. It's because I have so many good memories with her that, you know, I hate thinking about the, the bad times. So I went over and uh, I spoke with him, asked him the questions that I had, and he removed any and every doubt from my mind. He had his stories about how people were trying to frame him, about how horrible the cops were. 
Vanessa becomes convinced that Raven is not responsible for his wife's murder. Now he would try to persuade her to start a life with him. He started talking about me moving in after probably just a few weeks. And that was very, very fast for me. And I told him that I wouldn't be moving in with anybody if I wasn't at least engaged to them, knowing that I'm going to spend the rest of my life with them. Were you worried that this might be a mistake? I didn't have a question in my mind at the time. But Vanessa's father, a former police officer, does. He has a cop's hunch and a father's instinct. The Christian side of me wants to believe that he's innocent until proven guilty. The police officer side of me says there's something wrong with this picture somewhere. Raven is summoned to an awkward face-to-face -face meeting with Vanessa's parents. They asked him if he had had anything to do with his wife's death. His response was, uh, he kind of sidestepped the question. and He didn't say, yes, I did it, or no, I didn't do it. He said, I loved my wife. I loved her so much. Which insinuates that he didn't do it. But he didn't come right out and say that he didn't. He was in tears, and Vanessa went over and put her arm around him to console him and comfort him. She says, no, I'm, I, I, I know the guy by now, and I, I'm really convinced that he's, he's not uh, guilty of this. At the end of it, they still had their reservations, but soon after that, Raven asked my dad for my hand in marriage. Vanessa and Raven are married in her parents' backyard. It would be a blended family, his seven-year-old son and her six-year-old daughter. Vanessa's mom gives her a kiss and gives Raven a message. Just take good care of my little girl. He promised me he would. A honeymoon in Las Vegas follows, and Raven tells his bride something that still makes her shudder to this day. And he started talking about Janet and how mad he was after she died. Not how sad, not how heartbroken, just mad. At whom? Just that she was dead. And then he cuddled up closer to me and he said, I promise I'll never hurt you. I didn't know what to think about that or how to feel about that. It scared me. And that's not all that scares her. Even before the honeymoon's over, an outburst from nowhere. Within moments, he could switch. He could say the most horrible things. I was an effing whore a lot. And then moments later, he would apologize. I'm sorry, I was just mad. That's just what I say when I'm mad. That's just what I do. Then, Vanessa says, Raven's mood swings become physical. He grabbed me and threw me up against the wall, and then I fell. Later, he tried to convince me that I had tripped. He began to call my own family and my own friends, telling them that I was horribly depressed and bipolar, and um, that I probably needed to be institutionalized. Just four months into their marriage, Vanessa becomes more and more frightened for her safety and begins to make plans to leave. But it's Christmas Eve, a time when her family traditionally gets together. And as she and Raven get ready to go to her parents' house for dinner, another incident of unprovoked violence. He had me backed into the corner and screaming at me, poking me in the chest, just yelling at me. I ended up with bruises on my chest from him. He started gathering his things, and I wasn't gonna stop him, and that fueled his fire. Vanessa believes Raven is trying to set her up, building another narrative that she's unstable. Could he be hatching a plan? I think he was in the process of setting it up with family and friends that I'm suicidal. After seeing the Jekyll and Hyde that I lived with, his, his eyes would just change. It was very scary. Vanessa has no idea how much Raven Abaroa was more sinister Hyde than Dr. Jekyll. 
These six women are desperate to warn her. He's a dangerous person. We were fearful for her, as we are fearful for any woman that he becomes involved with. When we come back... Twenty continues. Once again, John Quinones. Clear across the country, these six women have been tracking Raven's every move. Why? They are the sisters of Raven's dead wife. And when they hear he has now remarried, they're desperate to warn the new bride. We just wanted her to make sure that she would know what she was getting into and that we were fearful for her. They knew only too well the kind of man she married. Raven had mesmerized their sister, Janet. She was just infatuated. Everything about him that, that he would do, she was in love with. Janet grew up in a solid Mormon family, the seventh of 10 siblings. Her sisters say she was so easy to get along with. A very sweet spirit, loving, kind. At Southern Virginia University, Janet already had a boyfriend, but that didn't stop Raven. She was beautiful, attractive. I just felt so much comfort when I was with her. Janet is convinced they can have a storybook life together, and marriage is not far behind. It was awesome to be able to kneel across from her and, and marry her for a time and eternities. For these newlyweds, time and eternity begins at their new starter home in the small colonial river town of Smithfield, Virginia. They attended the local church where they meet neighbors Tim Dowd and his family. Tim becomes a sort of father figure. We were just part of a big family. They both came from big families and they didn't have any family in the immediate area, so we, they kind of adopted us and hung out at our house a lot. Hello, folks. Merry Christmas. In their Christmas video card, the Abaroas seem like the perfect happy couple. We wish you the best and the warmest feelings this holiday season. Janet, what would you like to say? I would like to say Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Yeah, he appeared to have his act together. I mean, he was young, newly married, had bought their first home, you know, had a couple nice cars, you know, and a motorcycle, and like, wow, this guy's kind of off to a pretty fast start. They soon moved to Durham, North Carolina, and both land jobs at a sporting goods company. But the change of home brings another big change. Raven has a dark secret that would be heartbreaking to Janet. He tells her he's been sleeping with other women. He came to her one day because he wanted to be out of the marriage and explained to her that he had been cheating on her with several different people. And very soon after that, she found out she was pregnant. She didn't know what to do. She didn't want to raise the baby as a single mother. Just two and a half years into their marriage, her husband leaves her, and Janet, scared, reaches out to a family she trusts. You could tell she wanted, she needed somewhere to go. She was crying, very distraught, and she told me she loved Raven, and that she didn't want to have this child by herself. She loved him, she wanted him back. Tim agrees to talk to Raven man to man. After all, he sees him almost like a son. And I kind of read him the riot act in a major way. You know, what the hell do you think you're doing? You're married, your wife is pregnant, you need to grow up real quick. He, oh, he promised, swore up and down, that uh, he would no longer cheat on her, that she was the only one for him who would make it work. Months later, Raven moves back in when Janet gives birth to a boy, Caden. Raven appears to be a loving father, in awe of his son. But he is in love with other people's stuff, too. He's caught stealing high-end athletic equipment from his employer and reselling it to help make ends meet. He pleads guilty to embezzlement, avoiding time in the slammer. But Janet doesn't give up on Raven. Their lives seem back on track. And on a spring evening, Raven says Janet is doing the laundry while he is doing chores around the house. We looked at Caden sleeping, made sure everything was good with him, and put our arms around each other and, and you know, said, I really love you. As Raven recalls, he gets ready to go play soccer while Janet is getting ready for bed. When he returns to their four-bedroom home nestled in the woods that night, things seem out of place. He says he makes a horrifying discovery. I'd always go in and give Caden a kiss. I just feel his warm little body, and you know, that's when I 
Found out that something wasn't wrong. Kathy Cheek and Janet Abaroa were co workers and close friends. Upon hearing the morning news... Police aren't saying how she was killed. Durham police will only say her murder was not random. She races to Janet's home on Ferron Drive. I got there and saw the... caught the yellow crime lab tape. I was like thinking maybe it's not this house, maybe it's next door. But it won't, it was her house. I said, is it a little tiny blonde-headed girl that's dead? And I didn't want it to be her. But it was. Early the next morning, Janet's parents are awakened by a phone call. It's Raven. He was calling to tell them that Janet was dead and she had committed suicide. We automatically knew that was not right. She wouldn't have done it to Katie. No, she would have never killed herself, ever. We knew that wasn't true. In fact, police quickly realize Raven's claim of suicide is flat out wrong. Janet has been murdered, and not with a gun. She's been stabbed to death. Janet Everoa was found inside her fair and drive home last with what appeared to be a stab wound in her chest. Janet's family and friends are desperate for answers, desperate to find out who murdered her. I kept talking to Raven about, you've got to help solve this case. He hasn't helped the police. He hasn't, like, set out a reward of, oh, you know, help, help me find my wife's killer. And surprisingly, only four days after the murder, Raven leaves town. He returns to his boyhood home outside Salt Lake City. My thought is if somebody were, murders my wife or a child or any close family member of mine, I'm banging on the police door saying, what have you done lately? Raven did nothing. Raven provided cooperation at the beginning of the investigation, but there have been subsequent requests for interviews that have gone unanswered. Police are curious about Raven's knife collection, some of which are missing from the murder scene. And remember that Christmas video? Well, with Janet in the background, Raven weirdly brags about a brand new knife for his collection. That's my new knife got for Christmas. Thank you, bought it myself. My dad would be very proud, I like to collect knives. But could someone else have used one of Raven's knives to stab Janet? Investigators find a bloody footprint and DNA at the crime scene and they don't match Raven. But with few other clues, the case goes cold. Janet's family wonder why police aren't taking a harder look at Raven and a possible motive. He had taken out a life insurance policy soon after she was pregnant with Caden. How much was the policy? 500000 on her. Is he capable of doing that, doing it for the insurance money? Absolutely. Even though Raven declines a polygraph test and stops cooperating with police, he doesn't have a problem making his case on a local TV show. I wasn't involved with the death of my wife, that I would do anything in the world to keep her here with me, and, and that's something that I think that people who truly know me can understand and appreciate. Was Raven innocent? Could the murderer be a stranger who left a bloody footprint? The answer might lie in Janet Abaroa's grave, a clue police can only uncover by looking directly into her eyes. Janet Abaroa doesn't get to rest in peace. When we come back here, you'll see what they found after exhuming that body, and it's something about her eyes. Any guesses what they were looking for? Tweet us right now. Use the hashtag ABC2020. Elizabeth and I will be right back. Now, more of Sleeping with the Enemy. Once again, John Quinones. Before the honeymoon is even over, Raven Abaroa's second wife, Vanessa, suspects he got away with murdering his first wife, Janet. He could get away with murder. But I think he thinks he has. But Vanessa says, at least for a while, Raven was able to fool her and the police. He would make me believe full-heartedly that everyone else was trying to pin everything on him and that he was um, an innocent man. Janet's family says they were never fooled. I knew he killed her the morning I found out, the exact second 
There was no doubt in my mind. I said, why did he have to kill her? He hasn't like set out a reward of, oh, you know, help, help me find my wife's killer. Though family and friends push and plead, years go by without an arrest. This is a circumstantial case. It's hard. It's not easy. Well, you know what? Sometimes justice isn't easy. Finally, four years later, Detective Charles Soul gets the case. The hard part about this case, too, is for me, is it's almost like you had to have like a time machine to go back. This is unfinished business for Soul. Years before, he was one of the first on the scene with a canine police dog. Now he's the one hounding Abaroa, who is 2,000 miles away in Utah. Hey, let me call this guy and see if he wants to talk to this, you know, North Carolina detective. And I played the dumb so Southern cop, and he ate it up. And watch this strange video. Abaroa records himself after one of those nosy phone calls from the cop. He wonders what the cop is really after. I feel myself getting frustrated. Uh, I'm not 100% sure why. You know, the more stuff I give them, the more stuff that gets leaked to uh, any type of pending litigation. In that video, Abaroa also begins to wonder how he might bankroll a defense. I need to win the lottery. You know, if I were to win $3 million, I would dedicate $2 million to fighting this. <laughs> Two thirds of my winnings, if you would. So says Abaroa's story just keeps changing. The lights were on, the lights were off, the child was crying, the child wasn't crying. You don't get those things wrong if you're telling the truth. To the detective, Abaroa's story is beginning to fall apart. For one thing, if Janet was killed by an intruder, Sol says he would expect to see signs of a violent struggle. Nothing was disturbed in that room. As a matter of fact, the blood was contained in a very small space. And you gotta remember, just on the other wall is her child. So it would have been normal for that room to be destroyed. There was no struggle. The killer came up upon her and she never resisted. Why is that? Nancy Grace has also been on the case. This is what was missing. Some of his, Raven's, beloved knife collection. His wife was stabbed to death and his laptop. And she points out how lucky Abaroa got with that laptop, the one supposedly stolen by the killer. He backs up all of his files off of his laptop onto disks just hours before his laptop is stolen and his wife is murdered by an intruder. It was almost as if he knew that computer was about to go missing. And then there are Abaroa's beloved throwing knives. Detective Soul says he was very touchy on that subject. When I brought up the whole throwing knife thing, it always was like a, it's kind of like the dentist poking at a tooth that's bad. He became frustrated with me, like, why do you care about this? Well, it's kind of important your wife was stabbed to death. Knowing police are desperate to find the murder weapon, Abaroa records another odd video, which police will later find. That's his hand, caressing the blade of a knife he says was overlooked by crime scene investigators. All right, this is a knife that has been in my possession since I got my stuff back from my brother and my dad moved out of my house for me after Janet passed away. He claims he happened to find it packed away among his possessions. It's a throwing knife, but I'm gonna be uh, mailing this today um, so that he can give it to the detectives. Is Abaroa taunting the detectives? Could this be the murder weapon? It just kind of was bizarre that, you know, he would all of a sudden mail a knife that would be consistent with the, the wound that, that she receives. Abaroa's story is that the murder happened at night after Janet went to bed when he was off playing soccer. But police suspect Janet was killed earlier when Raven was still at home. That's why Detective Soul was struck by something he saw in an old crime scene photo. When you look through the crime scene photos, the first thing I'm looking at is, well, her contact lens case is, is open. If Janet was wearing her contacts when she died, that suggests Raven may have been lying about her going to bed before he left. Janet's family says she always took her contacts out at night. I said to myself, well, if she's ready to go to bed, you know, and she still has her contacts in, you know, that's unusual. If that hunch is right, it could blow a hole in Raven's alibi. Police take a drastic step. 
The body of Janet Abaroa is being exhumed tonight. In the age of CSI and DNA, authorities go to work in a peaceful Pennsylvania cemetery with the bluntest investigative tool of all, a backhoe. It was a necessary part of the process, but it was, it was horrible to see the family have to go through that. The chilling sight of police tape marking the spot amid the tombstones in Janet Christiansen Abaroa's family plot. Grave diggers doing their grim work in reverse. Police hoping to unearth secrets that had been buried with the young murdered mother. Janet's body headed back to the autopsy table. And when it comes to the contact lenses, the medical examiner has a eureka moment. When we exhumed her, yes, they were. They were present. Her contacts were present. Proof from the grave. The most powerful evidence yet that Raven is lying about when and how Janet died. It's still a circumstantial case, but police believe they have enough. Well, let me remind everyone that under the law, under the black and white letter of the law, circumstantial evidence is deemed as powerful, if not more so, than direct evidence, and a jury can weigh it as such. Yes, this is a circumstantial case. Does that change whether he's guilty? No, it does not. Abaroa is arrested, extradited back to North Carolina, and put on trial for the murder of his wife. Next, the other women called to the stand, revealing Raven's secret life and the secrets they'd rather keep buried. He just wanted to be done with her. Plus, the jury hears the biggest shock of all, Janet's new pregnancy, when sleeping with the enemy returns. We return to 2020 and sleeping with the enemy. Here's John Quinones. Durham police find 25-year-old Janet Abaroa murdered. Stabbed to death. Her husband found his wife's body when he got home. It was a small town murder that made big news. Tonight, jury selection is underway in the Raven. It had taken eight long years from the night Raven Abaroa's wife was found dead on a hallway floor to get to trial. Job one for prosecutors, dismantle Raven's reputation as a loving father. Do you sound like and the ex-girlfriends made it easy to paint him as a serial philanderer. How did you meet the defendant? Initially, I believe he came up and just introduced himself. Did he flirt with you? Yes. Did you flirt back with him? Yes. Jennifer Walker says she dated Raven while he was taking a time out from his marriage and living on his own. How soon after he moved into that apartment did you and the defendant become physical? Um, pretty soon. Annabelle Haviza was a minor, just 17, when Raven began pursuing her. She testified that he made her feel nervous. What if, if your, your wife finds out? You know, what if, if she looks at your cell phone records or anything like that? Yet, she says Raven Abaroa knew how to cover his tracks. He said, I've got um, a different SIM card that I use, and I switch out the SIM card so she won't, she won't ever know, you know, that I've text messaged you or called you. Still, he made her uncomfortable. In his car late one night, Annabelle says he aggressively pressured her into sex, and she feared for her safety. We pulled off, and eventually we ended up having sex. Um, and I just wanted it to be over. And I just kept going like this and saying, okay, if something happens to me, I'll leave, you know, my hair in here, something, you know, so if they search the car, then they'll be able to find my DNA or something knowing that I was here. After that night, she says she never saw Raven again. The whole thing just makes me feel small and little. I just wanted to be done with it. But Annabelle wasn't the only one to testify about Raven's violent streak. Remember his second wife, Vanessa? You think he's a murderer? Yes, I do. She had her marriage to Raven annulled. And today, Vanessa is a star witness against him, testifying to his physical and psychological abuse. He told me how much he hated me. And how much he didn't care if I died and he expressed how much he wanted to hit me. And he swung his hand back, and he stopped right before he hit my face. 
and got in my face and laughed at me for flinching. I then had to compose myself and be late to my bridal shower. After the women in his life testified, the jury heard a bombshell. At the time of her death, his wife Janet was pregnant with her second child. She went to the doctor. She cried and said that it wasn't going to be good, that Raven wasn't going to be happy that she was pregnant because he didn't want a child at that time. Statistics show that the number one cause of death of pregnant women is homicide. Something about the wife or the partner becoming pregnant escalates the tensions within the home. It can become just too much for certain people, and by that I mean certain men. Defense lawyer Manny Dexter argues that Raven might have been a philanderer and a cad, but that doesn't make him a murderer. So they struck back, starting with the crime scene, charging that it was contaminated. You can see that they're not wearing protective clothing. There was quite a bit of blood. It was a pretty horrific scene. And they raised the intruder theory. A bloody footprint was found near the body, yet it didn't belong to either Raven or Janet. We do know that all of Raven's shoes were tested, though, including the ones that he was wearing that night, and there was no blood on the bottom of those shoes. That is a footprint that is not identified. And the defense insists Raven could not have killed Janet. His alibi? He was at a soccer game and Janet was in bed when he left. But the prosecution totally demolished that alibi the day they exhumed her body. The reason? When they looked behind her eyelids, there were her contact lenses still in place. It was a hard contact and it would be absolutely unusual, pretty painful for her to sleep in these contacts. So Janet was not in bed. Prosecutors tell the jury she was actually in the kitchen. The evidence? She's obviously making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and doing the dishes. She's taken her rings off to do her dishes, which she commonly did. Her rings are still sitting there by the sink. And no unknown robber in sight. That unknown would have walked right past her wedding ring that was on the counter. I mean, that just doesn't make sense. So this was no robbery gone wrong. Instead, the prosecutor, Charlene Coggins Franks, says the killer was Janet's husband, and he was waiting on the second floor. He calls her. Come upstairs, Janet. He's waiting for her with the knife. Bam! She never saw it coming. She clutches her chest. She goes down to her knees at this point. What's he do? He comes up behind her. He's got, he's got to finish it. He's already started it. She falls face down. They list the motives for Raven wanting to kill his wife, an unhappy marriage with an unwanted baby on the way, and a deep financial hole. Did that half million dollar insurance policy he took out on Janet offer a way out? In closing, they again showed Raven's bizarre video, where he seems to be hoping for a payday with a snicker. If you win the lottery, you know, if I were to win, $3 million. I dedicate $2 million to fighting this. That's what I mean, because it's a fight. You need money, you need power. Both sides rest. Who would the jury believe? 11 hours later, deadlock. What's holding up the jury, or who, when we come back? Once again, 2020's John Quinones, and more of Sleeping with the Enemy. Trial Day 34, the state of North Carolina versus Raven Abaroa. After three days of deliberation, his fate is finally being decided. Janet's sister prays for justice, but the 12 jurors in courtroom 7B deliver a shocking decision. I don't think that additional time is going to change our final outcome. The verdict? There is none. The jury deadlocked 11 to 1 in favor of guilty. We are a home jury. The judge has no choice but to declare a mistrial. We can't make you reach a verdict. The outcome devastating. Raven on the verge of tears, upset at the prospect of another lengthy trial. And behind him, his mother crying. And the other side overcome with emotion too. Janet's mother and sisters sobbing. 
This jury member explains to us how a single holdout could not be swayed to find Raven Averroa guilty of first-degree murder. He decided that it was better to let a guilty man go free than it would be to send an innocent man to prison. Janet's family, certain of Raven's guilt, is crushed. So when you hear, we're well, going to have to retry the case, what goes through your mind? You pretty much collapse. <laughs> dread. Definitely dread. It's going to be another long six weeks. You didn't want to go through another trial? No. No. We been wanted done. it over. Over and done. Oh, us. A new trial was set to begin this week. But just days before it was to start, a stunning reversal. You plead guilty this morning, similar to a plea bar. Yes. A coward's plea. One of Durham's most high-profile murder cases coming to an end tonight. Some closure for her family and friends. It's an about face as dramatic as his appearance. He was once a soccer stud, but now not quite the ladies' man. Raven Abaroa, who always maintained his innocence, took a deal, not for murder, but for a lesser charge. It's called the Alford plea. A defendant neither admits nor denies, but accepts punishment on the crime. Janet's family reluctantly accepted the deal because they didn't want the risk of a not guilty verdict after another long trial. I believe that they did not want, under any circumstance, for Raven Amaroa to get away, to escape justice. Is it justice? It's a rough shot at justice. One by one, Janet's friends and family speak out in court. This is her father. You know, Janet missed Caden's first steps. She missed out on Caden's first words. She missed out on being called mommy. The family hoping to persuade the judge to deliver the maximum sentence. Any time that you will serve will never be enough for the pain that you have inflicted on my family and all who loved her. The defendant will receive an active sentence of 95 to 123 months. Just eight to 10 years, the harshest punishment allowed under what Janet's family considers a very sweet deal for him. With time already served, Raven could be out in less than four years. Raven Amaroa is going to be released from jail before his 41st birthday. He's going to walk free. In my mind, that makes every woman out there a target. Raven Abaroa did not testify at his trial, but now finally breaks his silence to explain why he agreed to the plea deal. So I would just like to state that I didn't receive a fair trial the first time. I don't think I'll receive a fair trial the second time. And the fact is, I love my family very much. And I don't think it's worth risking the possibility of spending the rest of my life in prison for something I didn't do. I take this plea to ensure that that doesn't happen. And that's the only reason I did not kill my wife. A slap on the wrist for him, but a slap in the face for them, Janet's five sisters. That was like he was stabbing us right in the heart. We've had an open wound. It hasn't been healing at all. And him doing that just put salt in it. Raven's second wife, Vanessa, also finds little comfort in the deal. Were you surprised that he accepted the plea? I was shocked, but I was more than that. I was shocked at what the plea deal turned out to be. He could be out in four to six years. It's not, that's not justice at all. It's not justice. Vanessa feels there's no justice because she can't shake the notion that like a bird at midnight, Raven will one day come tapping, tapping at another victim's chamber door. Your advice to women who come in contact with you? Please, please don't be drawn in. And please get away as fast, as fast as you can. Don't walk, run before you're caught in the trap. I was lucky enough to get out. Janet was not. I don't want to see that again. So what do you think of that sentence? An outrage or a rough shot at justice, as you heard Nancy Grace just say? Let us know on Twitter using the hashtag ABC2020. We'll be right back.
That's our program for tonight, but tune in tomorrow for a special 2020 Saturday with Barbara Walters. It's all about the lottery fever that's going around this week. $400 million at stake. Ever wonder why so many winners want to stay anonymous? We all know about the gold diggers that come crawling out of the woodwork, but this case, this one ends in murder. Mm -hmm. That'll run it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm David Muir. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas. For all of us here at 2020 and ABC News, good night and have a great weekend.